sermon text today will come from Matthew chapter 11. We'll start in the seventh verse. Before we begin, let me give some context. We're in the, in the midst of a, a series of sermons where we're going through the Gospel of Matthew, looking at every place where Jesus talks or teaches about the kingdom of heaven. So we want to learn about the kingdom of heaven. And um, today we come to a place where Jesus will describe the relationship that he and John the Baptist have with this kingdom of heaven. And, and we'll see that today. But before we dive into verse 7, understand, I want us to understand where we're at. John the Baptist has been arrested. He was arrested for, um, for preaching against the lifestyle of Herod the ruler. And Herod, what, what happens when you preach against the kings is they often will throw you in prison. And that's what happened with John the Baptist. And he is sending his disciples because John has begun to wonder, is this Jesus that I've pointed to? Is he, is he really the Messiah that we've been waiting for? So he sends his disciples to ask that question. Jesus, are you the one that we've been waiting for or should we expect another? And, and Jesus tells John's disciples, go and tell John what you've seen, that the sick are healed, that the lame walk, that, uh, that, that the lepers are cleansed. Go tell them all the miraculous things that you see because what he's essentially saying is that my, my deeds are speaking for themselves. I'm doing everything the Messiah was predicted to do. And so we pick up the scripture today as his disciples are sent back. But, but before we dive in, I think that the question John asked is an important one that at some point all of us ultimately consider, isn't it? We say, are you really the one? John is in prison and he is going to die. He's going to be beheaded. And so he's sort of asking this in a, in a strange sort of way. Are you... Jesus, are you really worth dying for? And at some point when we consider our own faith, we really have to ask that question too, don't we? Jesus, are you really worth changing everything in my life for? Are you really worth reorienting everything to do something completely different than what I would normally choose? Are you really the one that we've been waiting for? Jesus sends... John's disciples back, and then he begins to address the crowds, and that's where we pick up in verse 7. Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 7. As these men were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. Yes, and I tell you, one who is more than a prophet, the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. We'll stop there for a moment. And, and notice what Jesus is doing. He's, uh, he's trying to help people understand why John the Baptist, why his ministry was so important. You notice him using some humor here? People say, well, Jesus is always so serious. He's, I don't know if you see this. He's got some humor here. He says, what did you go out to see? He's talking to crowds of people, most of whom went out to see John the Baptist when he was engaged in his ministry, baptizing and, and teaching people to repent and get ready. He said, what did you go out there to see? Did you go see some reeds blowing around in the wind? Did you go to see kings dressed in knights' robes? You don't see that out in the wilderness, do you? So Jesus is employing some humor here, but he ultimately comes down to this. You went out to see a prophet, didn't you? You went out to see John because you believed that he was a prophet of God and you wanted to hear what God had to say. That's why you went out to see him, isn't it? He says, yes, indeed, he did go to see a prophet, but he's even more than a prophet. He is Elijah manifested. Do you remember what we read in Malachi earlier? That was... That what, what was read from Malachi are the last words that were written in the Old Testament, and they predict that before the Messiah comes, Elijah will return to get, to get the people ready for him. And Jesus says, John was him. John exercised the, the authority and the power and the, the spirit of Elijah. That's who you went out to see. And, and what does that say then of Jesus? Of course, he is this Messiah. John is this bridge between the Old Testament and the New. And something that's also really interesting is that the people were willing to go out to the wilderness. Wilderness is not a fun place to be, especially not the Judean wilderness. It's hot, right? There's 
No, there, there's a, no extra food, only food that you bring out there. It's a day's journey away, so you gotta at least kill an entire day, maybe a whole weekend to go out there. And, and people are going out into the wilderness to see this man dressed in camel's hair and eating bugs. Why did they go out there? Because they longed to hear the word of God. Imagine if you had to spend your whole weekend Go out into the middle of nowhere, there's no restaurants, no hotels, only what you take. Got to spend the gas money to get there, drive all the way, spend the entire day to do that. Would you do that? Most of us wouldn't. Going out and starting your ministry in the wilderness is not a great way to plant a church, is it? <laughs> I'm going to plant this church in the middle of nowhere. It's going to be hot. People are going to have to really sacrifice to come out here. And yet the people of Israel were willing. They flocked to John out in the wilderness. Why? Because for almost 400 years between the last thing that Malachi said, Israel had not heard from a prophet. In almost 400 years. They were hungry. They were starving for the word of God. And when they found out that there was a prophet in the wilderness, John, who was speaking for God, that hunger drove them into the wilderness to hear from God. I think we, we struggle with this in American Christianity, don't we? We... we, we we struggle to have that hunger for the Word of God. What we have a hunger for is, you know, church programs. We have a hunger for church being just the way I like it. We want it to be convenient. We want it to be easy. We want it to be accommodating to me. What if I said, well, the worship committee is considering having a worship service at 3 o'clock in the morning, 50 miles from here. And, and if you get caught coming, then you'll be arrested. You know, that's the case in many places around the world, in Libya, in China, in Iran. You only have to meet at obscure and obscene times, and, and if you get caught, you're in prison. And yet people are doing it. Why? They're hungry, hungry for the Word of God. I pray that we don't forget that, that we too become hungry for the Word of God. Let's look at verse 11. Jesus goes on to say this, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. In what sense is John least in the kingdom of heaven? Well, he's the greatest among those born of men. It's certainly not his personal righteousness. John the Baptist is personally very righteous. In fact, uh, when he was born, he's told not to have uh, any wine or strong drink. What that probably indicates is that he was to take a Nazarite vow, which is a very sort of holy and set apart person. He was a, a very righteous person, chief among, I mean, he would blow us all out of the water put together as far as righteousness goes. He goes out in the wilderness and wholly devotes himself, every aspect of his life, to the Lord all the time without ceasing. So it can't be his personal righteousness, but what then? I think what, what Jesus means when he says that John is least in the kingdom of heaven is in regards to his office. His office, his job as this, this final prophet of God, his job is to point to Jesus and say, here he is. That's John's job. Here he is. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what John says. And, and Jesus says, even as great as John is, his job is the least job in the kingdom of heaven. Why is that? Well, because all the prophets before John, they could only point to say, get ready, get ready, Jesus is coming, the Messiah is going to be here. John gets to actually point to him and say, here he is. But we, from our perspective, have an even more important office than John. Do you know that? I'm not saying you're more righteous, I'm not. But what I am saying is that you have a more important job than even John the Baptist did. And it's not to just simply point to Jesus and say, here he is, that's the least, that's what, that's what John did. Our job is to point to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. John never got to do that, but you do. You have the opportunity to share the gospel. Before you can have, be a minister of the gospel though, I think, and I think we all are called to be ministers of the gospel, disciples who make disciples. But before you can do that, um, let, me, let me minister first to you. Let me remind you of the gospel, maybe some of you for the first time to hear the gospel. When, you, when we talk about the gospel, we have to lift up two attributes of God. They must be lifted up. First, that he's holy, and second, that he's love. Both are equally important. God is holy and God is love. When we say God is holy, what does that mean? It means that he's beautiful. 
It means that he's lovely, that he's, that he's everything we desire, that he is, he is more than we can imagine, and, and we see God as high and lifted up, and who never does wrong, and who's altogether righteous. And, and yet, when we think about God's holiness, we also can't help but realize that we are not that. We are sinners. We, we've fallen short of all that goodness. And so we cannot be in the presence of God. That, that's caused a separation that we feel at a heart level. And anyone you talk to and witness to, they're going to feel it at that heart level too. But here's the other aspect. That God is love. That God loves you so much that he would not let your sin and your separation remain. He wanted you to be with him no matter what. And so what he did is to send his only son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to die as a substitute and pay the penalty for your sin. So that when, when you trust in Jesus, your sin is gone, completely forgiven. Why? Not just for the sake of forgiving your sin, but so that you can be in the presence of an all good, beautiful, glorious, holy, wonderful God. He loves you so much that he made that a possibility, a, re a reality for you. Now, how do you get that then? And that's, that's the point that anytime you're witnessing the gospel, you want to get people to, too. And it is to say this, that you, that you have to go to the cross. People's sin is real. Um, whether or not they'll talk about it in the language of sin, they understand at a heart level this is what separates them from God. And so the only remedy for, the sin is, for sin is the cross. We go to the cross and we say, listen, if you want this one who loves you so much that he died for you, you can have him. But you have to want him more than anything else in your life. Jesus will take second to none. He says, unless you hate your mother and your father, your children, you cannot be my disciple. You have to want Jesus more than your wife or your husband. You have to want Jesus more than your children, more than your job, more than anything. And when you want him more than anything, you get him. That's the good news. You get this all glorious, all good God. And that's the gospel. And you have an opportunity to do something even greater than John. Most Christians say, well, yeah, you know, whenever I get the chance, I'll tell people, hey, Jesus, he's pretty important. Well, that's what John did, okay? John did that. John pointed to Jesus and said, here he is. He's an important guy. Follow him. But you have a responsibility even greater than that. John is least in the kingdom of heaven. Your office is even more important because you get to point to the cross and say, that's how much God loves you. That he forgave you of your sins. That you can be with him forever. That you can want him more than anything. And you become then greatest in the kingdom of heaven, not by virtue of our own righteousness, but by virtue of that Christian office to minister to others. Let's, let's continue then in verses 12 to 15. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. See there, uh, Jesus ties in what I was speaking of earlier, how John the Baptist is himself Elijah. But it, it's, it's interesting here how the kingdom of heaven is manifested in both John and Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is manifested in John's preaching truth. He's preaching, uh, he, he preaches truth against Herod's relationship with his um, now wife. It was, uh, we won't get into a whole lot of it, but he, it, basically he's breaking the law in the way he married his now wife. And John preaches truth to him. And, he, and what happens in, as this manifestation of the kingdom comes forward in truth? Well, he gets arrested and eventually beheaded. And you say, wait a minute, that's not supposed to happen if Jesus is the king. It's because we know that, that Jesus' kingdom is what he says here, taken by violence, taken by force in this world. And then we see it manifested in Jesus himself, don't we? Jesus, who is the king of heaven, who is, who is healing people, who is cleansing them, who is, who is uber nonviolent. Jesus is so nonviolent. In the Garden of Gethsemane, one of his disciples loses his temper, pulls out a sword, strikes off a guard's ear that's arresting Jesus, and Jesus heals this guy's ear. He is the ultra nonviolent uh, king. And yet, what happens to him? He meets a very violent end in the crucifixion. Why? Why, if Jesus is the king, does this happen? Because we know that the kingdom of heaven is taken in this world by violence. 
But we know that in the end, that that kingdom will not, that this kingdom, the kingdom of this world will not prevail. That's that revelation image that we read, isn't it? Jesus comes in on his white horse with all the armies of heaven. And no army can stand against that when he ushers in his kingdom in full. We take a look at our world, though, and it's still true, isn't it, that the kingdom of heaven is taken by violence. Around the world, we see people who are executed, beheaded, persecuted for being Christian, for evangelizing. Um, it's against the law in many countries and, and violently against the law. You say, well, what about here, is it? Well, no, it's not here, but I'd say this, it's not here yet. It's not here yet. Um, as the kingdom of heaven advances, the kingdoms of this world advance hard against it. And I think we're beginning to see places where standing on truth and on grace are finding legal lawsuits and perhaps eventually violent force. Let's read then in verses 16 to 19. But to what shall I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to other children and say, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, he has a demon. And the son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, behold, a gluttonous man, a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. These are interesting little verses. It may not be really easy to sort access them. Let me see if I can help you. He, Jesus starts to talk about the way that children play and how they play different games. He says that there's one sort of game that children play where they play the flute and it's a happy game and all the children are invited to come in and play this game. Um, and then there's another sort of game where they play a dirge, which is like a funeral march and they're pretending that they're at a funeral and they invite children to come in and pretend like they're at a funeral. And what he's saying is that, that God is inviting us in many different ways into this kingdom of heaven and in so many different ways, the people of this world have rejected it. Remember, um, so Emma and, and Kalea, they of course like to play all sorts of different games and they play happy games. Let's say, let's play house. You see little girls play house and you got mom and dad and babies. I remember uh, maybe a year or two ago, Emma was, uh, was really learning about death and she would see these, these vultures that would come down and start eating on rabbits or squirrels or whatever had been picked off in the road. And she had this game that she would play with her friends. She'd say, come and play vulture with me. <laughs> she pretend, one of them would pretend like they're a dead animal and the other is a vulture. Sort of a weird game, right? A morbid game. Um, but that's okay. It's children learning and, and exploring how to play. And they invite one another into play. They say, come play with me. Come play house with me. Come play vulture with me. Whatever it is. And, and here we see John the Baptist and Jesus both. They're both inviting people into the kingdom of God in different ways. And we need both of those ways. Some of us need one, one way more than another. John the Baptist had a very hard way, didn't he? He says, repent! The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right now the ax is lying at the root of the tree and every tree that doesn't bear fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. That's one way to invite people to get their act together, isn't it? To come into the kingdom. And here's Jesus who comes in a whole different way. And he says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and you'll find rest. Take my burden upon you. You'll find rest for your souls in me. Jesus invites with a much more um, sweet tone, doesn't he? A tone of grace. Both of them are doing the same thing. They're inviting us to come into the kingdom. Sometimes we need a John the Baptist to kick our butt a little bit, don't we? And sometimes we already have our heart broken and heavy laden. And we need a Christ who says, then come to me. And you'll find rest. In the kingdom of God, what we find is that rest. We're invited in a variety of different ways. Man, somebody in this room probably has been nudged in all sorts of different ways by God, maybe even today. My encouragement would be simply this, say yes. Come to Christ. Come into his kingdom. I'd also encourage you, as we are considering how to be disciples that make disciples, to remember that whoever you begin to witness to or, or speak with, they may need one of these instruments or the other. They may need more of a John the Baptist or a more of a graceful Jesus. Um, sometimes we do need a little kick in the butt and someone that you're talking to may need that. But other times we need someone to give us a soft word, to say God does love you 
And here's the proof that Christ died for you, to make a way for you. May this word be to the glory of God and for the joy of his people. Amen.